Hi, everyone. Welcome to Capital Vintage Charm School. Today we have Sarah Lloyd Stevenson from This American House, an online vintage retailer. Um, and she is going to give us all of her knowledge on Staffordshire dogs. And I'm so excited about this because this has become the staple of the grand millennials. Um, so I think that we need to be really educated on this so we can um, know what we're looking for. Sarah Lori, thank you so much for doing this. I really appreciate it. Thank you, Stacey. I'm excited to be here. This is such a fun thing you're starting. And I, I hope I can provide a little bit of intel on Staffordshire dogs. Um, I'm no expert by any means. So if folks have tidbits that I miss, things I get wrong, like tell us, let us know if you have additional um bits of knowledge because it's something there's not a whole lot of material out there but something I've loved to get to learn a little bit about in the last few years and you know what that's what I think this, this is what I want this to be about just people who collect we're not antique dealers <laughs> we're not you know we're just collectors and we like to hunt stuff so exactly okay Sarah Lloyd I'm going to be honest with you I know very little about them and I don't even have any so I probably need what? To know. I know I need to rectify the, that if only I had some to share <laughs> So Sarah Lloyd, what are they? Uh, so Staffordshire dogs are essentially just little earthenware figurines. That's a very important distinction between Staffordshire figurines and other collectibles we may come across from other countries or other parts of Britain. These are actually made of pottery. So it's clay, mud, you know, again, earthenware, stoneware. I'm probably mixing up a few of the terms here, uh, but essentially they're made from clay that's found in the Staffordshire area of England. And what's kind of neat, we, we can get into a little bit more details, but I do want to note that I said Staffordshire figurines, not just Staffordshire dogs. Staffordshire, excuse me, ugh, Staffordshire dogs uh, is just one example of a lot of different figurines that were made in Staffordshire, England, particularly in the 19th century in Victorian England. So there are a lot of different figurines out there of people, people on horses, other types of animals, zebras, lions, all sorts of things. The dogs have just gotten the most popular. But so I just, that's an important thing to note that when we're thinking about Staffordshire dogs, it's just one part of a larger universe, honestly, of figurines that came out of this time period from the region. Oh, that's interesting. I never realized that they made other things. Yeah. Huh. So they really are made in Staffordshire, England. Exactly. Well, for the most part, and we'll get through a little bit today of how you can tell if it's actually made there, which is a little tough. I'm not going to lie. I do want to start as we're talking about real or, or fake or reproduction. A really important caveat uh, that I think just generally when antiquing or thrifting or looking for vintage finds is if you like it, then it's a great find, right? That's a really important thing to think about when you're looking at Staffordshire dogs, because a lot of people will try to sell on eBay, on Etsy, dogs that they say, yes, 100% authentic Victorian Staffordshire dog. Uh, and honestly, one of my favorite quotes I've read about this in recent years is from a website that details some of the things I'll talk about today on how you can tell a fake versus a real. They said, if all of the dogs that are currently sold as real authentic Victorian era Staffordshire dogs, if they were all real, there would be no land or clay left for the <laughs> island that is England. That's true. That's um, or I should say the island that is Great Britain. Um, so anyway, uh, that's something to keep in mind. Uh, it's actually very rare to find a matching pair that dates back to the 1850s. So my reason is starting off the conversation here is essentially, don't worry, in my opinion, I think, again, I think this goes for a lot of treasures that we hunt. If you like it, if it's a reasonable price and it's worthy to you, that it's a worthy collectible. It doesn't have to be something that was definitely made in 1820, definitely in Staffordshire, um, that type of thing. And I'll show you today, I have some that I think Granted, it's hard, it's really hard to tell, and I'll go through that, that I think are actually authentic from the 19th century. Uh, then I have some that I know were made in the early 19th century, or sorry, apologies, 20th century, and some that I know have been made in the last 20 years. And I love them all Let's because they're all very different. Okay. Um, so again, as I said, they're earthenware pottery figurines, Staffordshire, part of the larger universe of figurines. And um, a cool thing just of the history as well, and apologies, <laughs> we'll try to keep this short and, and easily, easily digestible, but there is a lot of information to uncover. Uh, the important thing is these rose in, I guess, popularity really in the 18th century, actually. So Staffordshire figurines started being created in the region in the 1750s about. Mm -hmm. They got very, very popular during the Victorian era, so mid 19th century, the 1850s, 1840s. And what they were done, they were actually mass produced. Um, that's a term that we think of more in modern use, right? 
but there were actually a lot of different pottery makers in the Staffordshire area. And there are a lot of different towns that did it who did this specific type of pottery process to make the figurines. And so it was something that it would not have been necessarily seen as a fine item to have. They're pretty prolific. A lot of people had them. Um, I've even heard examples of them being, being given away in the 19th century as like a prize at a carnival or something. That being said, they were popular, people liked them. And a lot of times you hear them referred to as fireplace dogs or mantle dogs. Why? Because the most popular place for them to be located in a person's home were actually on the mantle. Huh. So that's why when you look, gray millennials, when you look, um, when you see pictures of, uh, of decor and where dogs are really placed within the home, very often it's on a mantle. And actually for that reason, because they were designed primarily to be up against a wall, so on top of the mantle, you don't usually see a whole lot of design on the back. And a lot of times the backs are pretty flat. So there's not as much 3D uh, dimension to it on the back because again, they were meant to be up against the wall on the top of the mantle. <gasps> another piece though, I do want to say this, I love about the history of these dogs is that another kind of myth about them is that some people put them on their mantle and some women would put them in their windows. And the purpose of putting them in the windows would be apparently that the wives of sailors, they would have the dogs facing inward when the husband was home. And when her dearly beloved was out to sea and she wanted to send a message to her passerby lover, she would change the orientation of the dogs to indicate, hey, husband's gone, come on over. Scandalous. I know. I no idea. That is so cool. <laughs> so it's a really, they're, they're really neat things. Again, when you think of the whole, I keep saying the whole universe of Staffordshire figurines, but it's a really cool thing in my opinion that this is something that we're pretty re readily accessible to the common, common folk, you can say, but really to anyone who lived in the region during that time, it was something you would very often find on a windowsill maybe or in a mantelpiece. But now that we've embraced is this kind of elegant, kind of extravagant seeming decor item. Uh, so again, I'll wrap up really quickly with the history, but essentially 19th century, that's when they were really taken off. And that's when people talk about an authentic one. That's usually what they're referring to. That being said, the production ended a good bit toward the turn of the, the 20th century, but came into popularity in the 20s, 30s through the 50s. And that's when we see most of our quote unquote reproductions. That's usually when they were actually made. Huh. I say quote unquote, because I do want to note, I mean, in the grand history of time, the difference between 1860 or even 1890 in 1920, not that huge. Right. So when people say it's a fake Staffordshire dog, I say, okay, well, maybe it's not quote unquote antique. However, 1920 is now 100 years ago. Let's keep in mind the traditional definition of an antique. So that's why I say, don't get too wrapped up in was it a Victorian era? Was it, you know, in the 20s? Was it in the 50s? If you like it, if it looks old, then, then it's worthy to you. Um, they did rise again in popularity in the 1980s. So that's actually about around the time probably my mom started collecting. I may be wrong on that. I know she has a few reproductions from that time that I absolutely love, which again, back to the point of if you like it, it's worth having. My mother has a pair that she bought in New England and the, in the 80s, I think, and I'm probably getting all this wrong uh, details, but it's blue and white painted and they are just beautiful. It's one of my favorite things in her bag. Uh, okay, so this is my quick collection of Staffordshire dogs. I actually love the, the, the look of just a, an entire collection together like this. They don't usually stay here and I'll share a little bit about where I usually keep them. But I've got dogs ranging here from, again, I believe it's hard to tell from the mid 19th century um, onto things that are a little more modern. And when you're thinking, when you're really trying to tell two things, you want to tell like, is it, were they actually made in England, number one? And number two, are they old? And there are a couple of different buckets uh, or, or specific things that I look for when you're trying to determine both of those things. Uh, first off is the material. Like I said earlier, Staffordshire dogs are earthenware, they are not porcelain. So I'll bring right here an example. Um, I think most of us could look at this and know that it's not an English Staffordshire dog. This is more of a, at least appears to be to me. I may not really be porcelain, not sure what it is, but this is a different type of material than what we see in some of these others. Um, similarly with this one, I will note, it actually says hand painted in Portugal. <laughs> so that's a pretty dead giveaway that that is not a Staffordshire dog. I like to call this a Staffordshire inspired dog. Again, I think they're beautiful actually available in my Etsy shop and is a great thing. I brought this out for um, St. Patrick's Day last year and I thought it was really sweet on my table setting. Uh, so this is a good example actually of inspiration, how, how Staffordshire figurines and dogs specifically have inspired um, artisans across the world. So you think about the material first. Uh, second thing is marks. So this was something a lot of people don't realize this, this actually came into popularity in the 20s through 50s 
when antique Staffordshire dogs got popular, especially here in the US, makers in Staffordshire started putting marks on it because they knew that there was this um, famous nature of having the Staffordshire brand. So they started marking the dogs with a maker's mark that said Staffordshire. So you'll see that uh, in a few of these, like for example, this one, I don't know if you can see that says old Staffordshire. Uh -huh. That is a dead giveaway that's not an antique. If there is a maker's mark, because as I said earlier, these were things that were pretty prolific in the 19th century. These were made by every potter in the Staffordshire region. So they didn't have, these were small shops. They weren't mass producing individually. I said mass producing earlier because there were just a lot of them, but they weren't marking things. This wasn't, you know, porcelain in the, during the area, I believe would have had marks, um, but this didn't. So the marks really didn't start until the 20th century. The potter started marking it as Staffordshire in the 20th century, knowing that the buyer, the collector, saw some sort of a value with that term. So if you see a mark that says Staffordshire, know that it's a 20th century reproduction, not an original Victorian or earlier Staffordshire dog. Another thing that's really important to think about, you know, I may keep using this guy. No, it's tough. Um, as we're thinking about like how you tell the fake versus the real, again, I keep trying to say caveat of fake versus real. Um, not, not one of these specific rules stands alone. So there may be a few instances where a potter did mark his pottery in 19th century. And everything that I say here, it's not an across the board rule. Again, because there were so many potters who did this that there's not no standard or consistency necessarily. However, if you can identify each of these issues on one single pair, then you may be able to, to ensure that you have an authentic 19th century pair of dogs. So I talked a little bit about, we talked about the so material. Sarah Lloyd, yeah. let me ask you this really quick. I mean, I guess the only reason that we would theoretically care if it was an original would be for price, right? Because obviously yes. these would be more expensive. Exactly. Okay. Exactly. Now, do the colors matter? Not necessarily. Um, they came in all sorts of different patterns and colors. So I've seen them in black. I've seen them white. So this russet red color is a little more popular. The reason for that is the dogs were originally modeled after Cavalier King Charles Spaniels. Okay. So that was a popular time from the King, from King Pre Victorian. So that was the you know they're trying that's the dog that they're trying to originally show. However, they're also Dalmatians. Um, I will say that as far as rarity goes, finding an authentic pair of Dalmatians from the time period is pretty difficult. Mm -hmm. There are a lot of reproductions, uh, folks who make them even up to today that you can get. And I love the the Dalmatians. They're very sweet. I don't have any. Uh, but that's one that would be a lot more rare. Uh, this russet red color was certainly the most popular, so that's the most prolific. Uh, an important note to that is it's really, really rare or tough to find an actual matching set that has remained intact and together for all of these years. So very often you'll see it, that when you're looking at them, that you know, you're in an antique shop or wherever you may be, a flea market, and it's very likely that that's not an actual original pair probably they've lost their spouse <laughs> uh, at some point along the way and they've just kind of meshed a pair together. So for it, it's hard to say though, uh, I actually, actually I think my, my, what I think are my two authentic pairs, which I'll point out here in a moment, I do think that they are the, the original pair because they really seem to go well together. Uh, but it actually leads to it's kind of the third point uh, to look out for. So you've looked for your mark, you've looked for your material, and then you want to take a look and say, do they look identical, right? Do they have distinguishing factors, uh, characteristics between the dogs? So let's take a look at these two guys right here. These look really similar. They go great together. This one's a smidge taller and you can see that their markings are different. That implies that they're hand painted and that they've been made to be individual unique dogs. So if you see the markings identical on both sides, it's pretty dead giveaway that it is a mass produced um, item from more modern times. These, none of these characteristics on its own can determine authenticity, but a lot of people like to think about the whole. So you have just in the process that these dogs were made, you would have a hole on the back to, re to let gas release. I will note, not every dog has a hole. So if your dog doesn't have a hole, that doesn't necessarily mean it's not authentic. However, in later times, so this was mo most of your older ones will have this teeny tiny little hole. Okay. and no other holes on the bottom. Um, I do want to point out, I don't know if you can see this, this has a little number two. Okay, yeah. So that is something that was done in the 19th century. So that could be a helpful thing. So there's another two. 
Um, I'm not sure the numbering, if that means one, two, two means this was number two and this was number two, so they go together. Uh, that may be something if someone knows, I'd love to hear. Um, but one of the things that people will think about, so again, little bitty hole is a good sign, but if you have a big hole, that means it's part of the slip mold process from later times, so turn of the 20th century. So that means it's not quite as old. Typically, again, it's a rule of thumb, it's not across the board. Um, I say that because I think that's something a lot of people think is just, you know, it's black or white, uh, yeah. and it isn't. Again, that's why you need to think of these other tests to throw it up against as you're, as you're trying to determine the age or authenticity. So let's talk uh, price really quick, if you don't mind. Mm -hmm. What would you say ballpark, obviously, um, yeah. for an older pair would be, you know, an appropriate price. So when we are out in <laughs> shops, whatever, and see them, we know this is a deal or this is too expensive or what are your thoughts on that? For the most part, if you find an older pair, I think anything under 200 is a bargain. Okay. Um, I think even 20th century sets that you may find um, are really good price if they're under 100. So I will, this is my favorite set right here and I'll pull them toward a little bit so we can look at both of them. And I found these in an antique shop in Fredericksburg for about $175. And these guys are huge. I mean, this is here, I'll just bring they one of them up. <laughs> they are literally my favorite pair right here. And again, if we take a look at him, he has no marks on the bottom. There's some like oil um, writing there. And there's a little fire hole in the back, no big hole. So I feel pretty confident that these are pretty old. Another thing, if we look at the detail of him, and this is different as the time goes on, is that you can see the paintbrush, right? It's very dainty detail. Similarly with his eyes, very dainty detail. You can see that there's been some just normal wear and tear where he used to have some gold, a gold collar there that's worn off. Um, now, one thing though, that this guy doesn't have that very often you would see an authentic one is a little bit of painting on the back. Now he's white, so there wouldn't be quite as much, but usually if you have an old pair, you're gonna have a little bit of coloring on the back. Now it may not be, again, remember how we talked about how it was flat? Okay. Is, there's, a, there's a kind of show, representation of how that is. Um, but see how his ears are painted on the back. Some of the more modern ones, they just don't bother about painting on the back. They did, for the most part, paint on the back during that time. But again, this pair, I think, is a bargain for under 200. I see them listed for up to 500, though. And again, depending on uh, how, how, how good they're looking and what their condition is, that could be a decent price. Um, I'll point out, this is a very, very popular. I actually have two pairs, if we look, who are like this. Okay. And some people will say that the separated leg is more valuable. Oh. People like that, right? So there are a lot of different positions. There actually are some 19th century dogs that are lying down, which are pretty cool. Um, the separated leg, though, I have actually yet to find one that I think is legitimately really old with the separated leg. Again, he looks pretty good. He's got details. He's got a little fire hole. Uh, but he actually has a mark on the bottom and a, dish, a second hole on the bottom. And I know I then have this pair who are definitely not super old because, again, look at the gold. A little more shiny, um, marked Old Staffordshire. And these guys are pretty much identical. So I know I think that these guys were made probably in the 1930s. Uh, and them, I think if you find one of them for under 100, I think that's a great price. And again, they're beautiful. I, I decorate with these all over my house. I have several pairs who are small like this. And I think that's a great buy actually. So. so let's talk about how you decorate them. Okay, so you said that, you know, traditionally they're on the mantle or even in the windowsill, which I think is adorable. Um, <laughs> where, how do you decorate with them? Where's your favorite place to put them? What do you think is, is kind of what the grand millennials are doing? These days? Uh, so one of my favorites is, and you can actually see here where I've removed a couple of them is putting them up on wall brackets. Right. I also have a pair that I keep on my entryway and a little table. I have a pair that I keep in my china cabinet, one of these little white pairs, because my china is gold and white. So I think they look really great there. Um, I've decorated with them on tablescapes before. This big pair, actually, I keep on my bar. So there's really new, no rule, right? It, it never would have occurred to me to put them, because they're so big, it was kind of tough, because I didn't want to put them here with the food dogs, but I wanted them to be somewhere central in my dining room. And I got this new chamoiserie bar and I thought this is perfect. So I have all my decanters and the dogs just flanking either side. Um, this larger pair, and I do wanna talk about them for a minute because they're really odd. And my husband calls these the creepy dogs. Um, these actually keep on the floor in my entryway uh, under a table. 
So I, I get there's no wrong way on how you decorate them and where you want to put them. I've gone from my walls to China cabinet bar to the floor, <laughs> literally from the window to the, to the wall. The wall. <laughs> um, so this pair actually I bought uh, last year and while going out to the Plains, Virginia for a polo, um, midnight twi twilight polo uh, game. And I just think they're fantastic. I've only seen a few pairs like this over the years. Uh, there's a pair, for example, on eBay right now for like $300, $400. They're just like this. Again, this is where I see this kind of nickel sized hole that makes me think they may not be old, but it's hard to say because they've got this great painting on the back. He has the little hole, um, really dainty details. His collar is well worn. Uh, and a cool thing I wanna point out, and this is kind of the creepy part is his eyes. He originally had glass eyes and we don't have them anymore. I, I should probably try to find some replacement little eyes here. But that was a very popular trend starting, I believe in about the 1890s was to add these glass eyes to the figurines. So that's another thing. If you come across a pair as I have before and I've regrettably sold them, uh, but a pair with glass eyes, which is kind of the first time I saw it, I thought, that's kind of weird. And then I did some research and said, oh, that's actually a neat thing. That's a, that's a legitimate um, detail that was used at some point. That is so cool. So when you, when you find them, if you find them in a place that isn't like an antique store, what are your suggestions for how to clean them when you get them home? Yeah, that's a great question. Um, and one I probably should have given a little more thought to because what I do just very gently, I wouldn't put any sort of like we, you and I love barkeeper's friend, right? <laughs> I, I clean my kids down with that if I could. <laughs> Right. Uh, I would not use Barkeeper's Friend on this. I would treat it similar that you would to any other earthenware or porcelain, okay. right? Gentle uh, soap and water and a, and a soft cloth. Okay. That's so uh, for the most part, you won't get one that's going to have a lot of buildup though. So hopefully you don't come across any tricky um, cleaning encounters, but that's what I would recommend. So I do have one other pair I wanted to show you. Oh, show me. Um, to think about grand millennials and how we've embraced just the the trend, the look, the the inspiration of stuff for our dogs. This is actually one of my favorite pairs. They're the little needlepoint pillows. Oh, oh I want <laughs> so them. these I got these from this shop Furbish online a few years ago. I don't think they have them anymore. Um, but just so fun, right? And that's what's so neat. I think about the grand millennial style is there are a lot of artisans and artists out there who have come up with new products from wrapping paper to Christmas ornaments that have kind of a Staffordshire design on them. And even a few folks our age who are now making them in, hot, in cool colors like pink and blue, um, that I just find really fun. So that's, I just want a shout out kind of to some of our friends out there who are doing some really neat uh, art around Staffordshire dogs. I love that you grew up with your mom collecting these. And so you grew up appreciating them from a very early age. So this is <laughs> like, this is old school to you. This is not, this is not it's not a new thing to me in the last five years no that is so cool so tell me really quick where should where are your favorite places to look for these um flea markets are probably my favorite so okay. you and I both love going to a good thrift shop right but we also know that thrifting is like a labor of love right it is a lot of hunting a lot of looking for very little return on investment right um that makes the hunt a little more fun when you go to a legit thrift shop like Goodwill or Second Avenue, Salvation Army. Those are my favorite places to, to go. Um, I will say I found one pair of Staffordshire dogs at a thrift shop in Good. three or four years. Well, Sarah Lloyd, if you have a minute, I have a couple of questions I want to ask you so we can get to know you a little bit better. Oh, good. All right. What is your China pattern? <laughs> my China pa pattern is Gold Aves by Royal Crown Derby. And that's what I mentioned earlier, gold and white. And I could maybe go grab one, but maybe I'll just share you a picture later because they're across the room. Um, but it's beautiful with uh, birds and just very delicate details of gold paint on a white porcelain plate. And I use it with Royal Crown Derby's um, Carlton Gold. Yes, Gold Days and Carlton Gold. I had to think about it for a second. Uh, but then for every day, I really love like Blue Willow and I have a uh, tobacco leaf pattern that's pr pretty cool that we use every day too. Yeah. Uh, what are you currently hoping to find when you're out on the hunt? What are you looking for here? Mm -hmm. That's so funny you say that because every time I go to a flea shop I, or a flea market, especially where you're a little overwhelmed or you have limited time, I usually think, okay, here are my three things I'm looking for. And if I don't find these three things, we're just going to move right on, right? Um, right now, and I've been on the hunt for this for a while because I keep seeing people luck out and I haven't, 
is a pair of ginger jar lamps. So actual double happiness ginger jars made into lamps. Um, I have a few blue and white lamps that I love, but that's really what I'm hoping to find for a reasonable price um, without having to pay you know, $500 for them. Uh, similarly, I'm looking for an antique jelly cabinet. So something I wanna use in our den area to stow toys. Uh, a chest would be great, but chests are way too deep and, and drawers you know, can pinch fingers. So my thought is a jelly cabinet that opens up maybe shallow and fit my space well. So, so smart. What is your favorite vintage find? <laughs> um, Pick, right? sorry, I'm giving that little uh, giggle at the answer, <laughs> before the answer of all this because it's so hard to say I will say th these dogs may actually be one of my favorites um, I, and and actually I am going to try to turn the camera if I can figure that out yeah but it is uh, oh maybe I can't oh there it is <laughs> sorry guys let's move these guys away this I actually just found for my son and I think I've shared with you before a few weeks ago, and you know, if you're going to ask about heirlooms or anything, it's not a family heirloom of mine, but it was a family heirloom from someone selling it on Facebook Marketplace, which was really one of the most heartbreaking things I, I've um, encountered. But this antique high chair, and look with if you know anything about this American house, you know that we love uh, eagle decor. My husband's a Philadelphia uh, Eagles fan. We have a pair of bald eagles who actually nest in our backyard. Uh, we love eagles. So this popped up on Facebook Marketplace. I reached out to the guy, went and checked it out. And, you know, I asked him, as you always should, by the way, this is a good tip in my opinion, um, that if you're buying something from someone, whether it's a flea shop or someone on Facebook Marketplace, ask them what they know about the item. You want to remember that history. You want to know where it came from, even if they, you know, worst case, they don't know anything. So this guy, he's selling this to me for 50 bucks. And I said, what do you know about this high chair? This is so neat. And he said, well, I'm from the Philadelphia area, and it was made for my grandfather 100 years ago. And I mean, I just like knife and chest. I said, you cannot sell this to me. You've got to be kidding me. Um, I said, keep it for your grandkids one day. Cause he told me that his, his grandfather had used it. His dad had used it. He had used it. His kids had used it. I said, save it for your grandkids. And this is the most heartbreaking moment. He said, my kids have grandkids. They don't want it. They bought, you know, I'm so glad <laughs> in no. plastic, whatever. And I said, oh my gosh, I gave my phone number. And I said, when, he when they change their mind, just call me because this needs to stay in your family. But in the meantime, baby Will and I are, are keeping it safe. But that's that, that and these dogs are probably my favorite finds thus far. Don't you feel like sometimes, I don't know, I just, I get really emotionally attached to these things. And I just mm -hmm. think like, I'm so thankful to give this life again. You know, I- yes welcome it into our home to make it part of our family. I just, these things are so- well, That's also the neat thing about grand millennial quote unquote yeah. decor is that we have a whole generation of ladies who are, who are recognizing that these are historical, really cool pieces that deserve a life. And, you know, when five, 10 years ago, even, and still today, we have friends, you know, who want to go to Pottery Barn or want to go to Ikea and great, I Ikea's got great stuff, um, but they don't recognize just, the neatness of, of carrying one of these things on. Um, so I kind of say, oh, their loss is my gain if their grandparents want to get rid of I'm stuff, right? With you. Um, <laughs> but, but it's a neat thing, I think, for all of us to recognize. Would you rather go to an estate sale or a flea market? <sighs> uh, again, uh, on bank for your buck for markets are better. So it depends because when you go to a flea market, you have the chance of getting the treasures of hundreds of people, right? right? We go to an estate sale as one person and like that lady either had taste or she didn't. <laughs> <laughs> All right. What about a thrift store or an auction? Thrift store. Thrift store. And finally, what is your most prized family heirloom? So that's a tough one because honestly, I, I kind of, I claim this high chair as my new family heirloom. <laughs> um, however, little things, and this is what's kind of about family heirlooms is there may be something you care about that has absolutely no monetary value. Totally. Um, I just lost my grandparents last year and I have two things from them that I will keep with me until my dying day. Um, one is a little needle point that says Sally's Kitchen that my grandmother made, um, my grandmother after whom I was named, um, that she hung in her kitchen for as, as long as I can remember. And of course, much you know, farther before that. So it's hanging in my kitchen now and it's just a really sweet, special thing to me. Um, a second is a little antique spittoon. If you're not familiar with what a spittoon is, I'm happy to share with you one day, but essentially it's what gentlemen way back in the day used to spit into these little brass um, 
pots <laughs> uh, in public locations, but it's one that there's a whole family story to it. I'll save you, but that my grandfather got some 50 years ago. And my mom remembers it when, from when she was little and it's now in my house and I keep little, little things in it in our living room. Sarah Lopez, so sweet. <laughs> well, I absolutely cannot thank you enough for this today. I am, I feel confident now that I can look at the whole <laughs> that I, I understand the markings and I feel very confident that I could go out, find a pair and know if I'm getting a deal and have an idea on the date. Um, so I know what the price is. Thank you so much, Sarah Lloyd. And again, she is with This American House on Instagram. I'm gonna post it here so we can all um, go follow her. She is fantastic. Her house is absolutely out of this world. Her son is precious and her puppy is <laughs> <laughs> thank you so much Stacey I so appreciate it adore you love you and just love this was a lot of fun love you thank you friend